Well, we have a challenging topic this morning, an interesting one, very interesting one, very challenging as much of First Timothy has been. Uh, Paul, to remember the context of this, right? So Paul wrote this letter, uh, and you kind of feel like as a reader of this epistle of First Timothy, that we're getting a little bit of the behind the scenes conversation as to the establishment of the church and how things are being formed and put together, the things that are to be important about the church, the stuff that matters. Uh, as one of the apostles, Paul now trains or equips and teaches his protege, Timothy, on what the churches in Ephesus need to look like. And in turn, what's important for all the churches of the world. Uh, what is it that matters? What is it the stuff, because the church matters, what are the things that the church is to be about? And the people within the church, what are we to be about? So that is 1 Timothy 6, where we're going to be today. Uh, and when I read this scripture, you will fully understand why this is a difficult passage today. But it need not be, and I hope that I can clear it up for you. But our, our sermon title today, which is important for every Christian in the world, is this. Work ethic matters. The way we go about doing our job matters, not only to God, but it matters with regard to our witness and the prosperity of the church. So we've all been there right? You've, you've maybe worked for someone that you dislike. Uh, not every boss is perfect, right? Um, we, we've been in jobs where we've been made to feel undervalued, maybe, or underutilized as an employee. We don't understand in our jobs sometimes why certain things happen. Why am I always passed up for a promotion while the other person always gets a promotion? Or why is it that the, the boss is always riding me and never rides somebody else? Um, we've all been in positions like that. We're asked sometimes to do work we don't want to do. And maybe even, I'm just throwing it out there, but maybe you've been stuck in a job that you did not want. I know I've talked to a few of you that are in that situation. I see some of you nodding. You've been or you are in jobs that you do not want. So how do, you, how do we function as a Christian in those environments? Well, let's read our premise text, our key text today here in 1 Timothy 6, verses 1 and 2. And what I'm going to give you today are two things, really. How the Christian should approach our work ethic, and then 10 principles to a healthy Christian work ethic. All right? So the first thing in 1 Timothy 6, 1 to do, Paul tells Timothy this. He says, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of Christ and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. So do you see why this is a challenging passage this morning? You may be sitting there this morning and saying, I'm not anybody's slave. And uh, most days you're thinking to yourself, I'm not anybody's slave. What does this have to do with me? I'll tell you in just a second. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, your word is powerful. We are assured of that. Your word does not return void. You have promised us that. But sometimes your word is a little complicated. It's, it's, um, it's difficult for us to wedge it into our cultural context today. But yet 
you assure us, Lord, that it's not our responsibility to wedge your word into our context, but the other way around. Your word is always true, always speaking. Your word is always right, even when our culture is not, especially when our culture is not. God, we want to be the best ambassadors for Christ that we can be. And that means even in the way we conduct ourselves on a daily basis, such as our our workplace. I pray that you teach us this morning from your word so that when people look at us, they see the risen Christ and they want more of him. And I ask that you do this in your name. Amen. So one of the biggest speed bumps in the Bible is the concept of slavery and servanthood. It is used by the culture simply because the Bible speaks of slavery and bond servanthood in a cultural context. The culture would have us, today's culture would have us to believe that the Bible advocates for slavery, for the bondage of one human being by another human being. And uh, I don't believe that's the case. I believe that the Bible was written primarily during times of culture where uh, slavery and bondservanthood existed. It was um, the concept of the day. It was the system that worked at the time. And like all the systems of world history, capitalism, communism, unions, uh, internet, on and on and on. Whatever the big concepts are that make society go, there's pros and there's cons to those concepts. Sin has entered those concepts and made those concepts less than optimal. And you say, Pastor, are you telling me that slavery has the potential to be a good concept? No, not in humans' hands, it it doesn't. But what slavery existed for at the time was to serve an important purpose. I want you to get away from the word slavery, and here's why. Because when you hear the word slavery, you're thinking the movie Roots. You're thinking Civil War and pre-Civil War American culture, especially Southern culture. You're thinking the way that uh, Africans were treated when they were brought brought to this country and sold and 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 abused and uh, treated in every way that is less than pleasing to Christ. That that's not the concept that we're speaking about here. The word for bondservant, and that's more the word I want you to focus on because I think it better appropriates what the writer is talking about. The word bondservant is the word doulos. Most lexicons define it as someone who is in bondage to or subject or in servanthood to. Now, that's different than what was portrayed in the movie Roots. Not that kind of slavery. The way a person would end up as a bondservant of another person, primarily in the times of Paul or even earlier, is uh, it it was a work arrangement, meaning this. Often a servant would work for another family under a master or a person, a boss in that family who was in charge of them. The reason the person would have to work for another family is because that other family was willing to pay off their debt. So you take today, you take out a car loan. Because scripture says uh, that the, um, the borrower is slave to the lender. We're all in bondage to something. We are all enslaved by something. We are enslaved by uh, sin, primarily, but we are enslaved by uh, 
Bank of America that holds the note on your automobile. You are enslaved to Chase that holds the mortgage on your home. You are enslaved to Capital One that holds uh, the promissory note on your credit card or your revolving line of credit. The, sl the, the borrower is slave to the lender. Same sort of concept here, except back in those days, if somebody couldn't pay that, let's, I'll use an example. Somebody could not pay the taxes on their property. In agrarian society, they couldn't pay the taxes on their property. Another wealthier family may agree to pay that debt off, and then someone in that family would serve as a bond servant for them. They would work it off. They would work off the debt. So one individual family might act as a bank for another family, and somebody in that family would provide a service in order to pay off the debt. That, that's one way that it would often work out. Um, some servants were more a part of the family than others. So oftentimes a servant would, would come in and they would be uh, with a family for a lengthy period of time and they would live on the property or under the household and they would almost operate as, it, as a, a, a minor member of that family. Sometimes the arrangements were healthier than others. Sometimes the work arrangements were more abusive than they should have been. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat this, because when you take two sinful individuals, whether they're believers or not, you enter the, into this relationship of, of, of work arrangement, and even with the best intentions, sinful personalities can oftentimes erupt into sinful behaviors in the midst, and the person who was in charge would become more abusive towards the lesser in the arrangement, if this makes sense. It was not an arrangement like Civil War era plantation or sharecropping. It was not that kind of arrangement. Although there were some bad actors in the midst of this, just like with capitalism today. Are there times where corporate America abuses the lesser um, of the population in America? Yes, of course. Are there the, the, the representative republic that we have in this country is one of the best in the world? Is it perfect? No, because sinful men lead it, obviously. And does abuse happen from our government towards the lesser individuals in our society? Absolutely. Same with this arrangement. Well, what happens now is that the gospel enters into this work arrangement. So uh, with the arrival of the gospel, these employment contracts sometimes became better, oftentimes became more complicated because you might have a, a bond servant who works in the home of an unbeliever and maybe they're not getting treated fairly. But they're, they're crying out and they're saying, but I'm free in Christ. I'm free in Christ. What do I have to do? And just to illustrate how big of an issue this is, slavery comes up. And Paul speaks to this issue multiple times in his writings. So what does this have to do with us today? Why do you work a job? Well, you work a job because you have to pay for stuff. Why were these people bond servants? Because they had to pay for stuff. We all have responsibilities that we need to take care of financially. And we're obligated. Look, I, I, I'd love to live my life going from 25-day cruise to another 25-day cruise. I'd, 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 love to be, I'd love to be circling Tahiti on a, a Royal Caribbean right now, right? Like, in just taking in the Southern Pacific breezes and enjoying life. But um, 
but God has called me to this time in my life to work. And the way we go about the work matters to God. Whether you are a bondservant or whether you're simply enslaved to Wells Fargo Bank. All right. So how should a Christian approach their work ethic? Two things from Paul's passage here that I want to highlight for us. And the first is this. For the Christian, the mission should drive our work ethic when among the lost. So in this text, verse 1 and verse 2, Paul juxtaposes this two different situations. There are bond servants who are stuck in a work arrangement with those who are unbelievers. And now there's this even more precarious situation where your boss, your, your master, is also a believer. So if a slave gets saved and they, they're in a, a lost household, how should they view it? And then what about those people where the master and the bondservant both get saved? Now they're in a different sort of, because the bondservant knows that the, or the, the master knows that the bondservant's free in Christ. The bondservant knows that they're free in Christ. So how do we behave in this arrangement? Well, our first point here about the mission should drive our work ethic among the lost. Paul uses the word yoke to highlight, I think, the difficulty of this arrangement. He says in verse 1, let all of us who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their masters as worthy of all honor. Um, this is tough. This is tough. Because what Paul is telling Timothy to do is make sure that if in, the, in your congregations, if you have people who are bondservants and they're working for a non-believing boss or master, they need to prioritize honoring that boss, that master. Sometimes that was easier than it was in other times. I'm just going to ask you a question, just so we can get away from this idea of, of roots slavery. Is it difficult sometimes as a Christian to go into your job and honor your boss knowing that he cares nothing or she cares nothing for Christ. Of course it is. Of course it's difficult to give your best. But Paul kind of explains why. He says in the second part of verse 1, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. So when you're a believer and you walk into a work situation with an unbeliever, we are, if we're not careful, everything in our mind can remain secular. We can think of this as merely a work arrangement. That the people that are mistreating us and the environment that we're in is all about uh, getting through the day, cashing a paycheck, uh, keeping our head low, and maybe someday managing a promotion and pleasing our boss. And what Paul says here is, you know, work as if you honor those above you so that the name of Christ won't be reviled. He's worried about our witness among the lost. One of the ways that we have an opportunity to be a great witness for Christ is based upon our attitude in how we tackle our jobs, especially with regard to those who are over authority in our lives. I'm not, I'm not asking you to agree with every decision your boss makes. I'm not asking you to agree with how your boss treats you. I'm not, I shouldn't say I. God's not asking you how to, um, that you need to be in agreement with all the corporate stuff that comes down the pike towards you, especially when you feel like you're being dumped on. But, if you can find opportunity to speak kindly and lift up your employer and honor them, just honor them. And what does that mean, honor them? It means that, it means that when other people are speaking bad about them, you refuse to do it. 
It means that, um, that when they maybe speak ill towards you, you do not return in kind. It means maybe giving them the benefit of a doubt. It's difficult to be a decision maker, especially when you're talking about a crowd of people with multiple opinions. It's difficult to be a decision maker. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And when you do that, you open the door for people to hear your message about Christ, to see Christ lived out in your life. Paul highlights the mission here. He says, God's name will be lifted up and the teaching will not be reviled. So when we go to work among the lost, we're actually going to work in the mission field, right? Keep that as a priority in your heart. Even for a bondservant, when they worked for an unbelieving master, Paul was asking them to keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the gospel the most important thing. Second, in verse 2, now we transition to the relationship when uh, you're a believer and the person who is over you is a believer as well. Paul says, point two, genuine brotherly love should drive our work ethic among the saved. Genuine brotherly love should drive our work ethic among the saved. While we may be motivated under the loss for the purpose of God's witness, when it comes to working under other believers, we're working under family. <laughs> we're working under eternal family. We're going to share heaven with these people. This, this guy that is, or this woman, that's asking you to do a little bit more work than they're asking everybody else to do, and you feel frustrated by that. Um, we're going to share eternity together. And there's also comfort in the fact that knowing that the same God who's judging our work ethic is going to be judging that Christian boss's work ethic and their decision-making as well. But maintaining that Christ, Christ-like brotherly or sisterly relationship is important to Paul. Uh, he says, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. The, the danger here is that Christian bond servants would feel like now because they're believers like their bosses, that it gave them the opportunity to speak out of turn or to take advantage of that relationship. And Paul said, no, 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 that must not be. If you're a believer, understand what your role is and understand what your boss's role is and respect those roles. Do not be disrespectful, but respect those roles. Just because you're both believers doesn't mean that you, you're given the right to chirp at that person because of some decision that they make or some policy, company policy that they need to enforce. Um, we need to be respectful. And uh, the way he says it here is the second part of verse 2, rather they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. I like this, all the better. It means that even more so than when dealing with the lost, we need to step up our game when we're serving with our brothers and sisters in Christ who are over us. And he says, those who benefit, we want to see our brothers above us achieve and prosper. So many times, like, we immediately come into a relationship or work environment and we view our employers, we view our bosses as the enemy or someone who is out to get us or someone not for us. And in a brotherly or sisterly relationship in Christ, even though they are over you, just like with everybody else in the body, I desire good for you, just like God desires good for you. If you happen to be my boss, it's irrelevant. I desire good for you. Now, I'm not saying these things are always easy. They're not. Um, because 
bosses do bosses do bad things just like employees do bad things. Um, hopefully less. But we have to work really hard as believers to love them as Christ loves them. And he says this in um, uh, the second part of verse 2. Rather, they must serve all the better. Those who benefit by their good service are believers, and they are beloved. Beloved. The word here is agapetos. It comes from the word that we know from the New Testament, agape. It's, the t- it's, it's, it's a divine love. These people are loved by God the same way we are loved by God. Work for them in that manner, in that regard. All right. Now, I knew it was only two verses, but I, I wanted to, I wanted to out of this, because Paul speaks to this uh, relationship of employer and employee quite often. And he does so at, at length in the book of Ephesians. So I wanted to take a short passage from Ephesians and elaborate on this idea of work ethic. Because in Ephesians, Paul gives us what I see as 10 principles of a Christian work ethic. And I hope that this helps you kind of build a a target, you know, like um, for when you volunteer at church or you go to work uh, in your job, whatever it is that you're doing where you're offering a service to somebody, I want you to keep these 10 words in mind, okay? So let me read Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. And then I'll share with you these these 10 principles. Ephesians 6, 5 to 9. Paul says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So here's what Paul's saying. Ten things to shoot for as as our Christian work ethic. And the first is this, obedience. We practice obedience. Where does this come from? Paul comes right out of the gate with it. He says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters. Obey. Life is full. Newsflash. Newsflash. Life is full of doing things that we don't like. Sometimes we like it. Sometimes there's stuff we like. Uh, I like studying for sermons. Uh, I don't like, be a good example of something I like. I like a lot of stuff around here. Um, I don't like fixing the coffee machine, Um, which we get a new one this week, which I'm really excited about. Uh, which hopefully means I fix less of the coffee machine. Um, But under the authority of another Christian, we should follow through on all their requests completely. I'm going to give you a caveat in a second. But obedience is non-negotiable. So if your boss, if you work for your boss and let's say you're a nurse, right? And you, you work for your uh, nursing supervisor and, and uh, you're an RN and you've gone through years of training to be an RN, you know, and you're at the top of your field. And on that particular night, three uh, uh, nursing techs don't show up. And uh, that's a disaster. Because now you have patients who are at the risk of 
bed sores and not getting to the bathroom and bandages not getting changed and all the other things that go along with that. You would have two options as an RN there. You could say, you could tell your boss, say, I didn't go through all this training in order to, you know, change bedpans. I'm an RN. I, I administer drugs. I take doctor's orders. Uh, this is my job. I don't know many nurses that would do that because their hearts are too big and they care too much. But if your boss says, I've got four patients that are pushing their call buttons, they need to get to the restroom. If you're an RN, you say, I'll get them to the restroom. You don't argue at that point in time and say, I'm above that. You go and you do it as a Christian. Um, now, here's the caveat. As long as what you're being asked to do does not violate God's law. If your boss comes to you and says, I need you to do some stuff. I need some research done on the computer. I know it's not your normal job, but I need you to research. Um, I, I, I need some research done on R-rated films. Uh, and you know that these films are against God's will and they're against the, your conscience as a believer. You know that there are scenes in these things that you don't want to watch. Then you say no. Say it goes against who I am as a Christian to do those things. And I'm not saying that you won't get fired. But you have all the right, based upon the authority of Scripture, to say at that point, that's not good for me. Um, it's like when the apostles were charged by the high priests to stop teaching Jesus. Right? And this is how that went down. So, high priests were in authority at the time, and, uh, but they came to the apostles and uh, they said, look, we told you, guys, to stop preaching in the name of this guy named Jesus. Knock it off. They threatened them. And, and I love Peter's response in Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So there is a line there. If you're asked to do something that is contrary to Scripture, you always err on the side of Scripture. But beyond that, we operate in obedience to our earthly authorities, and we do so for the purpose of a good witness. So obedience. Second one, the second target to shoot for here in your work ethic is respect. Respect. Paul says uh, to obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. We live in a society today where everything is, my opinion is the most important thing. That's not true. Uh, that may be what the culture says, but your opinion is not the most important thing. Um, you're, we're all going to die. Nobody's going to remember your opinion. Nobody. Uh, your opinion is not the most important thing outside the church. Your opinion is not the most important thing inside the church. Sadly, our opinion oftentimes is what can ruin our witness before an employer and fellow employees. We feel like that if we just pop off with our opinions, if we just speak our mind, that everybody is going to all of a sudden cave and the world is going to be a better place. It usually, almost always, does not work that way. And if anything, you're going to alienate your employer to you by insisting on your way or the highway. Fear and trembling says, I know that this person is in authority over me. I know that this person has certain aspects of control over my job and could fire me if they wanted to. And so I'm going to respect them in the role that they've been given. I'm not going to try and usurp them in how I live my life and do my job. Third word here, target to shoot for, is authenticity 
authenticity. Paul says, uh, bond servants obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart, a sincere heart. All we're saying here is this, sincere heart, the word means singleness or simplicity. The, the idea is that you're about one thing. You're not duplicitous in your approach to work. Uh, you go to work. You understand that this is your job. You do it. You're not, bless you, you're not um, doing your job in order to achieve some nefarious or alternative thing. You go and you do it with a sincere heart like you actually want to do it. You're not just going through the motions. The fourth word, we shoot for excellence. Excellence. How do I know that this is excellence? Because Paul says, with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. How am I to serve my boss? As you would Christ. Uh, again, I'm not saying this is easy teaching. I don't claim to know your boss. I've, I've had my share of um, duds, quite honestly. As a younger man, I've, I've had quite a few duds. I've had some great ones. I've had, a, I've had bosses who, when I show up to work, they're in their office doing their, doing their prayer and devotion. And then I've had bosses who are waiting at the door, beat red face and fuming, you know, like they've like all night they've been making lists of things that they're frustrated about. Uh, been on both sides of it. I get it. But Paul says, when you go and you serve your employer, do it as you would Christ. And here is what's beautiful about this. I think that this is one of the most freeing concepts in the New Testament. Because when I look at my boss, it's a lot easier if I picture him or her as Christ. It's a lot easier for me to do some things than if I just see them in their sin. And in doing that, we honor Christ. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24, Paul kind of explains this concept a little bit more. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever situation you're in, gang, whatever kind of difficulty in the relationship with the boss or however challenging your your work environment is. And I've been praying with some of you about those work environments. I understand. I just want to encourage you with this verse. You're not serving some dingbat who probably shouldn't have their position. You're not serving some unqualified and super frustrating, uh, maddening individual. When you go to your job, First and foremost, you're serving Christ. Do it as well as you can. After excellence, we, we move to verse 6 here in Ephesians 6, and, and Paul speaks to this next word, point 5. We shoot for diligence. Diligence. He says, uh, not by way of eye service. So when you work, don't work by way of eye service. What does this mean? Some translations say, uh, well, anyway, we don't, what this means is we don't work for show, but we work to do a job well. The most important thing isn't that we get noticed. The most important thing isn't that we stand out above everybody else. The mo and this is very anti-capitalism, by the way, uh, and I am pro-capitalism. But when we go and do our job, if we're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, we scripturally, um, well, that's one of our future points, but we do it in a certain way that is not about us, 
is about um, doing the job well, and that is enough in and of itself. So we do it with diligence, and we do it correctly. The next target that we shoot for, and this is point six, humility. This is where I was kind of hinting at in the last point. He says that uh, verse um, six, not by way of eye service as people pleasers. <laughs> people pleasers. When our objective when we go to work is the recognition of man, it can easily get us off track. We serve, and we, as believers, the difference between us and the rest of the world is that we work for an audience of one. Everybody else works for an audience of dozens, if not hundreds, trying to get the eyes of the lost world to notice them. We work so that the eyes of Christ are pleased with us. And that looks like humility. It doesn't need to be about us. Point seven, we shoot. Um, I'm looking at my grammar here. This is incorrect. But anyway, the word is purposefully. We do our job purposefully with purpose, right? Verse 6 says, um, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. The will of God from the heart is what I'm focusing on there. There's spiritual depth to what you're doing. You're not just doing a job to get a paycheck. We're doing a job in the spiritual realm as well. We don't think about that very often, but when I go and I punch my time clock or I go and I sit down at my desk or I call somebody into my office, that is a spiritual opportunity there. The will of God has an opportunity to play out in your daily work environment, if you allow it. We're always asking God, when we go to work, when we go to church, when we fellowship, when we're, we're enjoying and relaxing in life, whatever it is that we're doing, we are, as believers, we are constantly asking God, what is your will in this? What are you trying to do for yourself and your name in this? You, you'll hear this from me a million times. We, whatever your job is, if you're a flight attendant, you are not a flight attendant. You are a missionary cleverly disguised as a flight attendant. If, if you go to college, even if it's like a lower tier school like USF, you go to USF. It's a joke. My team lost yesterday. Got a kick me sign on the back. You're welcome to. No, if you're a college student, you are a missionary cleverly disguised as a college student. God's design for your life is that we are ambassadors and missionaries first and foremost, not RNs or students or whatever. So there's a spiritual component to the things we do, and we, we work our job with that purpose in mind. Point eight, we are eternally focused, eternally focused. John MacArthur referred to this as the eschatological aspect of your job. I thought, well, that's really heavy. How about we just say eternally focused? Paul says in verses 7 and 8, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, that he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. Eternally focused just means that when we do our job, we understand that a day will come when this life is over, when we will have to answer for the job that we do. Uh, as believers, you're like, oh, I'm free in Christ. I don't need to answer for anything. That's not true. We will have to answer for things. We will be rewarded for those things. Do a good job in that or that you may store up rewards 
in heaven. Point nine, <laughs> the word is kindness. We shoot for kindness. Woo, this one can be a hard one sometimes. Kindness. This comes, it's about time we flip the script here and let's beat up on the bosses a little bit. Verse 9, he says, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening. Um, there is no right on the part of either party, if they're believers, boss or employee, to threaten one or the other or to treat the other in a hostile manner. Here, Paul flips the script to the Christian boss, and he's saying hateful and harsh words aren't just something that stop at the church door on Sunday. Hateful and harsh words are something that stop at the work door on Monday. Because you come to church on Sunday and you speak nice to everybody, doesn't give you the right as a boss to then go into your office on Monday morning and speak any way that you want to both believing and unbelieving employees. If anything, your, your witness needs to go even higher on Monday morning. Because these employees that you are over they're in one of two camps. They either need Christ, and that's way more important than the job you do, or you're going to be sharing eternity in heaven with Christ, with them, right? So the way you speak to them matters. Last thing that we shoot for here, and this is going to sound like a very woke term. I don't mean it this way. Um, but as believers, one of our targets is equity. Equity. Verse 9, um, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality in him. If you're a boss uh, or if you're a Christian who's over somebody else, especially if there is a, they're a believer, remember this truth. God is not in heaven looking at you, thinking you are more important because you're the boss than that person is because they're the employee. God doesn't see, he doesn't see it that way. His relationship with us is on the same level. So Christ's relationship with the boss is on the same level as the relationship that he has with us. Our earthly relationships may be different based upon job, but the God who is in heaven sees the employee and the employer in the same way. Sinners in need of forgiveness, sinners who are saved by the grace of the same God. So we do ourselves well to operate under that understanding. I'll close with this thought. Some of the most difficult conditions to work under may have been as a doulos, a bond servant, back in those days, in ages past. Yet God saw it, according to his word, as a gospel opportunity. Shouldn't the same be said about us in our work environments? That when we go to work, whether it's a happy, skippy environment, or frustrating, maddening environment, it is a gospel opportunity. Um, and some of you may be like, well, I'm, I'm retired, or I do side jobs, or I don't really have a boss. Or... An example of this, even if you're getting paid $250 by a friend, to clear out some yard waste. Or, on the other extreme, your difficult boss of seven years at the job that you hate is riding you nonstop. Or maybe you're in a church where you're serving as a volunteer and a pastor or a leader in your church, you, you, 
you vehemently disagree with them on a decision that they've made, right? And you're thinking to yourself, I don't, I'm not going to serve in that church anymore because they changed the color of the front door. Uh, you chuckle. Like, people in this church, that's not an issue, but it would be an issue in some churches. And people would say, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to pack up my toys and I'm going to leave that church. I'm going to take my gifts and I'm out of there. Whatever environment you're in, we have an opportunity to choose Christ or choose ourselves. I want to encourage all of you today, no matter how difficult or easy your work environment, serve as in unto the Lord. Choose Christ and his mission for your work environment today. Because the same God who died for us, Jesus gave of his life on the cross in order that we might be saved from our sins, is trying to reach all those people in our workplace that we so much struggle and push against. God wants to see them saved too. And you might be the only light that shows up in their life. This week or this month or this year. Choose to be the light as an employee. Let's pray.